Hello and good evening. My name is Matthew Ogden. I'm an editor with LPAC TV, and I'd like to welcome you to a live broadcast from LaRouchePAC.com. Tonight, we are joined by Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, who will be delivering an international address of the utmost urgency, in which he will be addressing a reality which most people, including leading people inside the United States, are as of now trying forcefully to deny. Now, we have several questions which have already come in uh, from high-level institutions inside Russia and also here in the United States. And after Mr. LaRouche's remarks, which you are about to hear, we will have a brief opportunity to address the content of some of these questions. So, in the interest of getting right to it, uh, I'm proud to give you Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. Well, I have the, some bad news for you tonight. You remember, remember Gabriel Heater, who used to be on television and radio and so forth, radio for many years, and he would always say, it's this or that tonight. <laughs> and this, this is a night for that kind of utterance. We are in the, presently in the most dangerous period of probably all human history. Because for the first time in human history, we have faced, at least known to us, we face the threat of an actual extinction of our species. The problem before us is, takes the form of, here we are in the greatest crisis, the greatest financial crisis in really modern history, hitting us now. We have a president who intends to be reelected, who is an absolute disaster and a threat to the, practically the extinction of the human, a threat of the extinction of the human species if his policies are carried out. We have uh, government agencies, particularly in, in the Congress, which are utterly incompetent. That is in the sense that they have no witting sense whatsoever of the greatest crisis in modern history, which is about to strike us, and which, which has been about to strike us for some time. It's not only an economic crisis, it's also a threat of thermonuclear warfare, as thermonuclear warfare has never existed as a form of war up until this time. What the, well, just to get on what the war is about, the immediate threat, which has been there since before the death of Muammar Gaddafi, it was the intention of that time in killing Gaddafi was to set forth the basis for a pathway leading toward thermonuclear war. A thermonuclear war conducted by the United States, Britain, and other powers against China and Russia and other locations. That state of war an oncoming war has existed for some time now. Uh, generally, you don't hear much about it unless you look at the military side or, say, the Joint Chiefs of Staff's policies, which saying don't get into such a war. But we're on the edge of it. The key figure in this war plan is the current president of the United States, Obama. And if Ob the situation is such that although we have not gone to war yet, not the thermonuclear war. We still have, are on the brink of it. And the way it's supposed to go is this way. The Israelis are supposed to start a strike against Iran. Now, we don't know how deep that strike is going to be. It could go down 200 feet, for example, uh, 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 one of these kinds of attacks. Uh, this would be enough to trigger a war because Iran has relationships with other countries, including Russia and China. And it's known in Russia that if that war starts, the intention is to launch a thermonuclear attack on Russia from, uh, and from China, from the United States and Britain. The major force would be used for that in the war would be a full-scale thermonuclear war, full-scale thermonuclear attack coming as a technical surprise, uh, leading into a general preemptive th thermonuclear attack on the United States 
in return for a thermonuclear attack on the United States by, and Russia and China uh, from Britain and from the President of the United States. Now, such a war would, is always going to be preemptive. When you get to the magnitude of thermonuclear warfare, if you look at what our Navy represents in terms of thermonuclear warfare capabilities, launchable from the Pacific against China and against Russia. That means it's a first strike war, which is a knockout blow, is what's intended. And therefore, Russia has a similar view of what the realities are. And the, however, one thing is true. If Obama were not the president of the United States or were kicked out of office in the near term, then we would probably avoid thermonuclear war because without the United States thermonuclear capabilities, such a war could not be successfully stru struck. So we're looking, therefore, and we have to estimate that that's the danger. The danger of a provocation that counts as a fourth. First of all, the Israelis throw a deep thrust, brief thrust against Iran. That triggers a war. You also use, as also triggers, you use the attacks on Syria and on Iran as generally. These are the things. It started by the Israelis, who are supposed to not announce the day quickly when they're going to do it. The Israelis go ahead and strike with a deep thrust into Iranian territory. A provocation occurs against uh, Syria. This leads then to further confrontation because it comes now, they are on the verge of a war with Russia and China on one side, the United States and Britain on the other side. And British are really behind the whole thing the, to begin with. So that's the danger, the immediate danger. And no one in running for president, no one looking at the reality of the eco economic situation, which is about to collapse anyway, no one is paying any attention to these problems publicly under these present conditions. So what the public believe, what the press says in the United States or in Britain, but especially the United States, what the, the attitude toward Obama, the attitude toward these clowns on the Republican side, Nobody's paying attention to reality. We have two, two threats, the economic collapse, a chain reaction collapse in the transatlantic system which will take over the whole world. The other thing, a thermonuclear war which will leave maybe nobody alive on this planet, at least no human being alive on this planet if it starts. This, this goes into an area of total in, you know, incredibility. So that's where we stand. So it's in that context that the things that we have to consider tonight uh, are on the table. But there are many other things to consider because we, our intention is not to sit back and forecast a thermonuclear war and hope that we enjoy it or something. But the point is to eliminate it and to also to eliminate the factors which lead presently or in the future to such a result. And the danger is that no one who's running for president or similar kinds of office in the United States is saying a damn thing about this, which is the worst of all possible situations. Now, the great, we are dealing with great threats, economic threats to this planet, uh, in, in, combined with this military threat. We're, all, we're also dealing with the fact that we have a puppet president who is controlled by a British Empire. Now it's important to understand what the British Empire is. The leading figure in this whole warfare scheme is Barack Obama, the President. But Barack Obama does not really know or understand the significance of what he's doing. He has one way of looking at it. He's a killer. He's a mass killer. He's a psychopathic killer, in fact. He has exactly the, the uh, intellectual profile of the Roman Emperor uh, and therefore Nero and therefore uh, he acts on that kind of motivation but remember Nero killed himself when he found out he was no longer going to be the overlord and you have Obama is the same kind of personality the same kind of mentality 
And if he thought he were going to be defeated, he might kill himself the same way that Nero did. The resemblance is absolutely remarkable. One would have to say that somebody in Britain had to have picked Obama carefully out of a box someplace to find a man of a personality so exactly like, in a different time, exactly like uh, Nero as Obama. It's his mentality. I've looked at, I've done this on, uh, looked at this character for some time. And I, as I said in 2009, you know, here's the, uh, this man is an exact copy, psychologically, of the Emperor Nero. And he will obey that. Ever since I said that, in 2009, in the spring of 2009, Obama has done step by step everything I said he would do. Except I didn't say nuclear war or thermonuclear war. But everything else he's done, every policy, this man follows step by step the step by step kind of mass insanity eh, which was organized by the Emperor Nero. And foolish people with all this evidence before them, the fact I stated the case state by state, and everything that Obama has done state by state, uh, uh, state of operation, corresponds exactly to the kind of procession the Emperor Nero's case defines. And yet that may, being true, politicians and other influentials in the United States, in face of that fact, will continue to keep, keep this man in the presidency when, the, when Section 4 of the 25th Amendment prescribes precisely the remedy. Throw this guy out of office. He's nuts. And that's our situation. Now, there, there are other things besides this. We could stop this war by eliminating the factor of Obama's presidency. If Obama were safely tucked away in the booby hatch where he belongs, huh? the war would not go on because leading people in the United States understand that this is bad, that something should be done about it, but they lack the courage to do anything about it. That's the problem. That's why I have to stand up and do this because they don't have the guts to do it, even though many of them know that I'm right on this. Now, there are two things that block them from understanding this. First of all, there are the war threat itself. That is very frightening. They're afraid that Obama, uh, Obama might kill him because he, like the Emperor Nero, this man will threaten death or to things tantamount to death to anyone. He has intimidated some very strong figures in the United States, very powerful figures, with his threats of virtual death threats or imp implicit death threats. So we have people who are frightened who would otherwise behave differently than they are now. Right? So this man has to be removed from office. If you don't remove him from office, if you allow this thing to go to the, to the expected to the vote in November, you're going to find assuredly before November, you're going to see an event in the United States. You will see the attempt to launch a thermonuclear war by London and by Obama. You will see mass killings orchestrated by Obama against U.S. citizens, as is already being done in various parts of the world. People are being killed in violation of the Constitution. American citizens are being killed in violation of the U.S. Constitution by this president, uh, who is acting along exactly the road of Adolf Hitler in this respect, and nobody's doing a thing about it. That's our situation. So we have a puppet president, and that's what he is, a puppet president in the, in the, in the style of the Emperor Nero as a personality, and nobody's doing anything about it. And you look over on the Republican side, and you find a similar kind of trash, but of different vintage on that side. So as of now, the United States does, it does not have any perspective, honest representation coming forth for it. The, the election campaigns now in the United States are a farce, or because they're worse than a farce. But there are other things we have to consider. It's my intention, obviously, that we shall not go through these things. It's my intention that we shall not have a thermonuclear war or anything similar. It's my intention we shall not have the great crisis of economic crisis we are getting into now, because by spring, because of the, on, if the present crop program 
goes into effect, you're going to see starvation in the United States, in the United States population, a killer star process. So our, our, the two things are that. We have to deal with the war threat. We have to get Obama out of office. Otherwise, you're not serious about anything. Hmm? And four, Section 4 of the 25th Amendment provides the precise recipe for removing him from office. And it should be done now. And anyone who proposes otherwise is actually being, whether they intend it or not, they're being a criminal. Anyone who proposes the perpetuation of this man in office, since that leads potentially to mass killings in the United States as well as other horrible things, is not really fit to be a citizen. <laughs> so, but, we, but let's look at the other, other side of this issue. There, we are also in the most dangerous economic crisis in modern history, especially in respect to the transatlantic region of the world. Uh, y Europe, the whole Western Europe is collapsing, is beyond breakdown. Greece is being murdered, deliberately murdered, for payment on money it does not owe. An arbitrary assignment of debt was given to the Greek nation, a debt which it did not occur, but which is demanded of them as a contribution to the general pot, money they don't owe, except under this special system that was introduced by the British into Europe. Europe is, Western and Central Europe are essentially have lost their sovereignty. There is no sovereignty today in Western and Central Europe. There's not a single nation that's sovereign. They don't have a government. They have the relics of a government, but the actual decisions are made by a, a committee run from London. That is, going, that is now in the process of breaking up. The intention, of course, was originally to go straight from the killing of Gaddafi, which is supposed to lead into an attack on Syria and, on, and in Iran. It was supposed to lead then to a Israeli attack, weapons, nuclear attack on Iran which was to set off the whole trigger for going to the launching of thermonuclear attacks, thermonuclear warfare. And that's what the situation is. And if you don't deal with and understand that situation, you really don't know what's going on. But what are the remedies? Well, the first thing we have to do is recognize that the entire Western transatlantic system, in particular, is now hopelessly bankrupt on the books. The U.S. government is bankrupt. The debts of the U.S. government are beyond, could never be paid. And they're just piling on more debt. And it could never be paid. Not a penny could ever be paid. All one has to do at this point is point to the fact that this money will never be paid. And the whole bubble collapses and the United States and Europe disintegrate promptly. Because if suddenly someone says there's no money left, that all the money in the, in the Federal Reserve System is fake, that will never be paid, and that we're at close at that moment right now. The United States shuts down. Europe shuts down. And this great bubble is the problem. Well, there are some things we could do about it, and I think I'll concentrate this point on and, until we get to the questions on what this alternative is. First of all, we have to declare a form of bankruptcy. And that is, we have to, uh, in a sense, go through Glass-Steagall, Franklin Roosevelt's Glass-Steagall law. That's the first thing we must do, otherwise nothing is going to make, make sense, nothing is going to work. If that's done, then we will have the most of the debt, the Wall Street debt, will be hanging out there with no one accountable to pay its debts. It means you will be wiping out all, the whole section of the banking system which does not conform to a commercial banking system of the type associated with the Glass-Steagall law of Franklin Roosevelt. 
Now, the problem today is far worse than the mess that Coover had created back in the 1920s. So therefore, where, where the original Glass-Steagall law was, proved itself to be sufficient, sufficient means to cause a general recovery of the U.S. economy, no such effect could be had today. We must have the Glass-Steagall law because we must save that part of the, of the American banking system, the commercial banking system, which is valid. We just take that out, put all the accounts in banks which correspond to a Glass-Steagall standard of banking, and they must be protected by the federal government. There may be reorganizations and so forth, but the, in general, the commercial banking system, as a commercial banking system, must be protected by the federal government. All right. However, if we go back do the class Steagall today, that will not work. The reason it will not work is because we're so bankrupt that, there's no, that, that it couldn't work. Therefore, in other words, the, the federal government could not, by itself, under a commercial banking system today, could not act to support, to save the U.S. economy because the debts are too big, the shortages are too great. Therefore, we must go back to the original Constitution of the United States uh, before what happened under a certain president, Andrew Jackson. Now, Andrew Jackson was not a, a patriot of the United States. He was actually a sub-agent of a British agent. <clears throat> And what he did under his immediate boss, who was to become the President of the United States, what he did essentially was to, uh, what we should do rather, uh, is essentially go back to the original constitutional system and re reverse the banking history since that, that, that period. That means that we will have then, under a federal credit system, we will have sufficient credit available with projects like the WAPA and other major projects of that type, which will give us sufficient growth in productive employment to save the United States. Under a commercial banking system, and the conventional U.S. practice under a commercial banking system, you could not raise the credit sufficient to organize a recovery of the U.S. economy. So therefore, we must save the credit, the commercial banking system itself, right off the other part of the banking system as trash, because it is trash. It's worth nothing. That we can also, if we do it in the United States, Europe, which is about to go through a big change itself, continental Europe, we'll also have to make a change similar to our own. And Europe's ability to do that, to come out of this mess, will depend largely upon the role of the United States and its relationship, Europe's relationship economically, to Russia and China and other nations, including India. In that case, the world can come out of this mess. Without these specific measures, there is no chance for avoiding a general breakdown crisis, a chain reaction type of breakdown crisis of the entire planet. So these two measures are necessary. We have to also go back to Franklin Roosevelt's intention for the post-war period. That is also necessary. Roosevelt planned to use the Federal Reserve System under his direction to, to bolster an arrangement for recovery in Russia, China, and other countries as well as in Europe and bo to bolster a recovery of this part of the world. What he was going to do is essentially create a fixed exchange rate credit system, international credit system. That would have worked, but Roosevelt was dying. And when he died, Truman, who was nothing but a British agent, took over, a Wall Street agent in particular, took over, and went along with Churchill's program, as long as Churchill was in there, and suppressed the Roosevelt program. And, and what all Truman did was to facilitate a British reign of terror, political terror, inside the United States. Uh, and divided the whole nation on the basis of the so-called anti-communist uh, racket. And we only got out of that mess, which would have gone to outright fascism,
if we didn't get a new president, Eisenhower. Eisenhower saved the United States. He got us out of the war in Korea. And his getting us out of the war in Korea assured his presidency. And his presidency ensured a certain stability and progress inside the United States. But he was not able, in his two presidencies, to utterly remove that problem. The, the removal of the problem was entrusted to another president who was assassinated and whose assassination was praised and covered up by the leading right-wing forces inside the United States, including the certain governor of California, the Warren Commission. So the Warren Commission did, to, did that. What were the issues then with, with the case of Kennedy? Kennedy had done two things that the enemy couldn't stand. One, he was going for an economic recovery program, a serious one rebuilding the U.S. economy. The space program was part of it. Uh, the intent to launch NAWAPA was entirely a, 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 his proposal. It was going to be implemented. But the th key, issue, key issue was the question of the Indochina War. Because the purpose was to destroy the United States by a well-known method, which was used by the British already in the Seven Years' War, which is the way the British Empire was established. The Seven Year War, years war, which got all the nations but two of Europe into a war with each other, a protracted war for seven years, wrecked the economies of Europe, and out of it the British came out with the territories of India, the territories in Canada, all these kinds of things, and came out as, a, as an empire, an actual empire. The wars against China were an empire war. The war, drug wars were an empire war, and it was all done by the British, the British Empire, which represented the poli same policies that we attribute to Wall Street. So the Wall Street faction and the uh, British faction are one and the same thing. Wall Street banking uh, and British banking are part of the same thing. You have this Lord Rothschild arrangement now, which is the form in which it's expressed, which has taken us into the current, current depression we're in now. So these issues is what we face. We can eliminate these issues by going back, as I said, going back to the original intention of Roosevelt, what had been the intention and direction of, uh, of Kennedy, and those methods applied to those kinds of projects which Roosevelt intended, which Kennedy intended, would be sufficient to launch a general recovery of the U.S. economy and other economies in the world as well. So this is the main thing we're looking for, these kinds of remedies. And they're very clear. They're also part of our U.S. Constitution. What is done, like the, what was done by Andy Jackson, was a violation of the Constitution. It was tr virtually treasonous. And Andy Jackson was a friend of a traitor to the United States, Aaron Burr. And they Aaron Burr was dead, so they got a new banker in New York to play, replace Aaron Burr, and Jackson was there, and the Jackson, Jackson uh, uh, presidency established the systematic, systematic uh, destruction of the United States. It, and the only thing that saved us at great cost was the Civil War, Lincoln's leadership in the Civil War. Then the killing of McKinley started us back down the same, same road um, to, of destruction. And that's what we're faced with today. Now, the remedies are this, therefore. The remedy for the United States. We must have a fixed exchange rate system hmm, among nations. We must build this on the basis of reestablishing Glass-Steagall first, uh, the exact formulation of Franklin Roosevelt, Glass-Steagall. Any change in that would be wrong because all the elements of that are essential elements, and they all are required. However, as I said, Glass-Steagall is not sufficient now. We're too bankrupt. Therefore, we have to go to the next step, go back to the original constitutional system of the United States, which was based on national banking. The, the, the case of the first and second National Bank of the United States, a, a process launched uh, with a, with a, as part of the Constitution. Go back to that. That means we are no longer dependent upon other people's money. 
Now, the monetary system is other people's money. It's a private, essentially private banking system, hmm, which has been the basis for all empires before the Roman Empire, before the Peloponnesian War, hmm, even the legendary case of the, <laughs> of the eight more ancient wars. Hmm. These all were all based on the idea of monetary system. The monetary system was the idea that the somebody owns owns the world. So they utter what they call their official currency and prescribe all other kinds of currencies as being forfeit, suppressed and forecast. So by a monopoly on the idea of money, through the aid of military force and control of trade, we've lived to a system which are called monetary systems, in which a body outside the population controls the currency of the population. And then some of these guys who do this decide that they're going to be the kingpin on the, on the lot, on the neighborhood, the boss on the neighborhood. And therefore, they tend to congregate to try to create a worldwide empire. Now, the first successful effort in that direction was the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was essentially this kind of swindle. When the Roman Empire degenerated, as it had to, physically, it collapsed out of its own making. It's like the dinosaurs. They collapsed because they were defective in their own capacity. But then people started up a new empire. This time they started on Byzantium. And the Byzantines did the same kind of thing that the Romans had done. They went bankrupt, belly up. So they came up with a new system, the Venetian system the first Venetian system, which replaced Venanti, uh, 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 there. And then we, we, that, again, blew out in the 14th century, in the great, famous Great Depression, uh, the mass death of the Great Depression. Same thing. It took some time for them to get going with the other one, but the Venetian party still existed. And the Venetian party was able to prevent the uh, reforms, which were done by in, in, in uh, Italy at that point. These reforms were, were done and they, in a sense, resisted the collapse. So what they did is they organized another rage of war, starting with 1492. From 1492 to 1763, the world was tormented with a slight break in between, but by various kinds of international uh, revolutionary kinds of warfare. The bloodshed was tremendous. But out of this, you came the, what came known as the Second uh, Venetian Empire. And the Second Venetian Empire, which was brought into being out of various circles, against France initially, and became then the system which became the British Empire. And it started with wars in Europe, organized by the, the new Venetian party, as it was called. And this new Venetian party then organized what became known as the Seven Years' War, which had induced the nations of Europe, continental Europe, to fight against each other while the British and the, and, the, <laughs> and the Dutch sat outside and watched the war. At the end of this period of seven years, huh, then the British got, in, got involved and organized a treaty huh, out in 1763, which established the British Empire as an empire. It got all of northern Canada and other parts. It got whole sections of South America. It took, began taking over whole sections of, of Africa and other places. And in this process, and China was gobbled up, and Asia was gobbled up repeatedly. India was gobbled up. The, the takeover of India, which is one of the first major acquisitions, acquisitions in 1763, by the Treaty of Paris, the Peace of Paris. That became the new empire. Since that time, the world as a whole has been under the thumb of the British Empire. The British Empire is not a simple thing like kings and various ranks down the, down the line. It's, a, it's essentially a monetary system of controlling the mo money system of the world. 
And by controlling the money system of the world and outlawing other money, alternatives to that, they were able to maintain empires. And that's the way the system works. It works exactly the way that the British Empire works. It has worked all these years, all these decades, all these centuries. The same way. And that's where we are today. So therefore, the time has come to recognize that it's not how you manage your money, but what your money is. Is your money something that's owned by an oligarchy? To a banking system, which is nothing but an oligarchical banking system, which pulls swindles exactly like the swindle that was pulled in after, well, in my, my period when I'm going with this thing in 2009. It, what I was up in 2007 before then. This was exactly the kind of thing we were up against. We went back into a wide open monetarist imperialist system which built up this vast debt, this phony debt the Federal Reserve debt, the other kinds of related debt, which is worth nothing. It earned nothing. But this, this kind of currency, this kind of money that the Federal Reserve System pumps out now is a complete fraud. It has no intrinsic value. But what it does is the crushing of our system of, of money, which our constitutional system of money, which is a credit system, didn't exist. And so then when overreaching power, beginning with the fall of the Soviet Union, which cleared the way for the British to go wild. And so that's how this thing has been run. Now we've come back to the process. The China is more powerful than it was at that time. Russia has been regrouping. India has more or less maintained its situation, but even these countries of Asia, which have something in them, still, are weakened by the fact that the rest of the world is weakened. So therefore, the world needs to have a, a sense of unity on the idea of using a, a conception of monetary systems you know, and I'm creating a fixed exchange rate system in effect among these credit systems by create, establishing credit systems of, that the type in the United States is established for itself with the Constitution and use these vehicles on a fixed exchange rate system as Franklin Roosevelt had intended as his post-war policy with his big four uh, alliance. And what Kennedy had intended as policy in following Roosevelt. And this is our, this is our only hope. If we don't do this, we're not going to make it. Now there are other things that have to be considered. The space program and its implications are absolutely crucial. And those who are opposed to it have to be questioned. Because the problem is, is that we're vulnerable. This uh, solar system, this, uh, credits, uh, this galactic system is not doing nice things to us right now. And we're in a situation where we know now that we face the danger that some fat satellite will come crushing down on Earth, and that's the end of the Earth business, right, right then and there. So therefore, we have to think about as Russia has proposed, that we think about a defense of Earth, a defense against space war, a defense against large objects and similar kinds of problems disturbing us. We have to think about also that the galaxy is changing. The galaxy is becoming a little more dangerous than it was earlier. So therefore we have to do something about that not only to defend ourselves, but to take into account that we have, we have to deal with a galactic situation for Earth which is, and solar system, which is different than we've been used to in the, since mankind has existed on this planet. Now that means we're going to have to get some higher ranges of power. Now, the fr we have several forms of power which are quite essential, which are actually man-made. The organization of nuclear fission, as a, as a power source. Uh, it's a nuclear fission existed before that, but man did not willfully use that type of power. When mankind discovered the importance of fission as a source of power, uh, and the change in chemistry as a result of that discovery, uh, then we began to progress. Now, this is the, for the first time thus, our use of the organization 
of thermonuclear fusion, of, of fission. Yeah? Our use of that is a fundamental change in, the, in our re mankind's relationship to existence in this universe. Yeah? Because when we increase our power, as we do by first, using uranium, extracting from that the general principle of fission, we go to a, another really artificial form of power, thermonuclear fusion. We are now going to a still higher form of order of power, yeah? matter antimatter reactions. For example, thermonuclear fusion means you can take the trip, if you, once we get the system built, you can take the trip from Earth to Mars in a week. One week, Earth to Mars. And you can get a round trip on that one as well. So it means we're, we're, we, mankind is making the solar system and the universe smaller for us. So that our, It's not our uh, legs that are getting longer, it's our uh, what should you say, something else is getting shorter. <laughs> the world is getting shorter, the universe is getting shorter. Then we go to matter atom reactions, which are orders of magnitude more powerful. But again, these are cr available to us only as synthesized by mankind. So therefore, if we wish to defend our human species, um, we, have, we must first develop these technologies which are the synthetic technology where man is beginning to take charge of the solar system. And with matter and matter reactions, we can actually get close to being the manager of the solar system. So that's where we, that's where we can go. And if we take from an economic standpoint the policies which are implicit in what Franklin Roosevelt intended and before him, the founding of our Constitution, we can survive, we can progress, we can find the means of progress to deal with the threats against us. We don't have any predetermined simple recipes, but we do know that if mankind is able to increase mankind's power to exist in the universe, especially within this range of the solar system, and fend off some problems coming in from the galaxy, that if we can do that, we have a principle of survival. If we continue to sit here and do nothing to advance, if we try to go back as the greenies are going, the greenies of course are the new dinosaurs. You, you sign a uh, ticket, you know, I'm a greenie, okay, you, you put down di new dinosaur because there are species not qualified to exist and they want to reduce the human population, they think it's over, the world's overpopulated, well they are the first on the list to be underpopulated. So that's where we stand. That's, our, that's the vision of our future which we must have. We must understand this war, we must defeat the plan for thermonuclear warfare which is on the table. Those who deny it are stupid or liars. It's there. It probably is going to happen, it will happen one day, when suddenly it will happen. It will not happen as a trend. Suddenly it will happen. The trend, the accumulation of the potential for the unleashing of this horror is there, is building up. And you won't get a chance to argue about it unless you do something about it now. Don't wait for extinction before you act against it you won't be able to do anything about it. And what's going to happen, you can imagine, is our submarines under the command of this bo butcher, this insane butcher, Obama, carry out an order together with other facilities which are nuclear-powered facilities, an order to act. And you get the naval fleet, submarine fleet in the Pacific takes what it's got in those cans of theirs. There's no argument, no discussion, the kind of discussion that Obama talks about, no discussion. It will just happen. And it will happen as an intended virtual extinction event. It will be aimed primarily at the nations of Asia, the major nations of Asia, first. Because the United States is now in wreckage. Europe 
Western and Central Europe are wreckage, economic. But Russia is still alive and making motions of progress. China is a spectacular degree of accomplishment in recent times. Huh? And, uh, and the Asian area, of some, in some countries at least, is also potential. It may not be in the best shape the world has ever been, but compared to Europe and Africa and the, and the Americas, what's going on in Asia is very impressive. And it's, it's a possibility of the, a survival of civilization which might collapse in Europe and across the Atlantic would not be a fatal blow for the human species. It would be a terrible blow, but not a fatal one. Whereas if the war is an attack, nuclear, thermonuclear attack on Asia and Russia, then the case for humanity is a hopeless one. So we must classify people like Obama as not only criminally insane, but so criminally insane they must be kept in cages lest their influence spread. And if we don't have the guts to see things in this way and to act accordingly, there is no reasonable assurance of the continued existence of the human species on this planet. We might survive despite what they do. Some might survive but not much. And we notice that the British Queen has this funny idea of reducing the present population, the human population of the planet, from what had been seven billion people to one or preferably less. So that for the mind of the British Queen, who is criminally insane but not logically insane, she can calculate. The president is clinically insane and, every, and is sane in every other way. He can't calculate. He would like to, but he can't. So therefore, that's the thing that we confront. We're faced with this threat and nothing less than this threat. We have been lucky so far in postponing this event. It came first because partly people in the, in the Defense Department said, this is insane, don't do it. But the president says, no, we're going to do it. The military say, we mustn't do it. The president says, we must do it. The British insist that we do it. So as long as we, and the time is running out. The president is not going to wait. The British are not going to wait until after the election. They're going to proceed on the assumption that they've got control of the process now. They're going to act now. And the thermonuclear warfare will begin at some time near now. Unless Americans wake up and throw this brain sick president of ours out of office. The removal of Obama from office on the pleasant charges that he's unfit to serve, that he must be impeached or simply thrown out on Section 4 of the 25th Amendment, to save the United States' existence must be done. Don't wait for the war. It will come quicker than you want it to do. You won't have a chance to stop it after the election. It will already have happened. We must stop it now. And I hope there are enough people with guts enough out there to do it. Okay, uh, we have a few questions that have come in again from high level institutions inside Russia and in the United States. I'd like to start with one from here in the United States. Uh, this is a question from a group within the United States intelligence establishment who has been following Mr. LaRouche's work for several decades. This is their question. They say, Mr. LaRouche, you have advocated replacing the current monetary system with a credit system. Given the crisis within Europe, especially within the Eurozone, how would you propose to go about making the change to a credit system under these current conditions? Can the existing political institutions 
including the current governments within the 17 European Monetary Union member nations, carry out this transformation, they're facing an imminent breakup of the euro system in Greece and in other countries as well. What are they to do and what is your appraisal of their capacity to make such changes? We've got some loose cannons in the situation which complicate what the solution might be. But it's perfectly feasible. What it takes essentially is guts and insight. And the problem is if weak-minded and cowardly people are not likely to do any of this. And therefore you must put weak-minded and cowardly people in some kind of occasion until this thing is settled. Because they won't do it. They won't do it. For example, let's take the case. Glass-Steagall will wipe out most of the merchant banking system of the United States. And that's what the merchant banking system of the United States says. You will wipe us out. And the president says, well, we can't wipe you out. Wall Street says, we can't wipe you out. You wipe us out. So therefore, you have very little courage. And this is simply putting through Glass-Steagall is a shock which would bring down Obama immediately by its effects. Because you would have broken, you would have broken the power which could maintains this system. All right, now, that, all right, that the, the objection really comes, first of all, they don't understand what, the, the question does not fully understand the implications of the change to a credit system. Uh, that's the real problem. So, so therefore, uh, right, so theref therefore we have to uh, look at th some other things. Go to the, first we have to go, go to Glass-Steagall. That must be forced through because otherwise we're going to a break point in which there'll be a general chain reaction collapse, a total collapse of the monetary systems, the banking systems of, Euro of Europe and of the United States, for example. Um, they'll collapse and there will be no recovery. Right. So therefore, you, when you talk about merchant banking, you're talking about a dead man walking. Hmm? So don't try to bring a dead man walking back to life. He's gone. The corpse is still moving on some mechanical device or a watch in his pocket or something. Hmm? So, but the question says, but what about all those poor bankers and all those people who depended upon these commercial banking, um, 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 these private banking systems. What are you going to do for them? You're going to put them out of work. Yeah, sure. But we're not going to put them entirely out of work. We'll put them back to work. But they will have lost the ill-gotten gains, which are nothing but speculation and hot air. They cannot going to sell us with hot air anymore. All right, so they, they're wiped out. Those banking institutions, not all the banks, because we'll go carefully through all these banks, which are now mixed up between private banking and commercial banking. We'll sort the parts out. So the accounts that are viable, legal, competent, will be protected by the federal government. We will reorganize these elements of banking, reorganize them as a banking system. We will then simply wipe out all the other kind of debt, which is not, does not have assets to cover it. Hmm? Why? Because they're bankrupt. Why do you close a bank? Down a bank? Because it's bankrupt. That's what called bankruptcy means. So what do we do? What do we do with these poor people, these poor rich people who suddenly became unrich because money was cancelled? What do you do with these poor guys? Well, what you do is you, you give them a reemployment program. See, we have too many bankers. We have too many financial income people. Too many of them. We can't afford them. So therefore, they're going to have to be humbled a little bit. We'll get jobs. They won't be starved to death. We'll take care of them. We'll give them opportunities for new kinds of employment. It may not be what they've been doing before, but it will be, as citizens of the United States, they will be protected and given protection of the type they deserve. They will live on a poor, reduced income. So what? Many of us have existed on a reduced income. So they're turned in the barrel. So that's, that's the way you have to look at it. Now, the real problem here is, is they don't understand a credit system. That's why the question comes up. The first thing is the instinct is the shocking effect of wiping out all this commercial, this uh, commercial banking. 
but it wiped itself out. The Federal Reserve System is, uh, is no good anymore. It's bankrupt. It can't be salvaged. It's bankrupt. There's nothing there. Nothing there to cover the debt. So therefore, we have to, the United States has to be saved. All right? We go to, a, we shut down, transform the monetary system to a credit system. First of all, because the, any monetary system, even under the best construction now, could not possibly provide a sufficient rate of income, genuine income, to sustain the United States and its population. Therefore, a monetary system, which continues with what was conceived as a monetary system, no longer works. We're back to the, the president who got fired, dumped. So now it means we have to go to a credit system. The difference is this. A monetary system depends upon a ratio, a percentile income rate, uh, the basis for protection. The federal government does not require, in a credit system, does not require, and never did require, it required that the investments be competent investments, but it did not require that there be a guarantee, a money guarantee, behind those investments. In other words, if you've got a country, a nation, and you have people with skills and so forth, or potentials, and they don't have any money, could you organize an economy? Yes. It was done in the Massachusetts Bay Colony before the, the, the new nation party made a mess of that place. Huh? So therefore, you don't need money as security against money. What you need is the security of the possible performance of your employed population. That's what you need. So therefore, our concern, for example, we have large projects. We, we have over years you know, there are certain goods you cannot get in the United States as U.S. made. We're loaded with goods that are not made in the United States. You wear clothing that's not made in the United States. You drive cars that are not made in the United States. All these things. So where's your credit system? Huh? Not there. There's no credit system there. You're acting like you, you've, you, what you've got is a bunch of parasites who are gambling on money, which is worthless, actually worthless. Just ready to go is is like the game of Monopoly, the, co the card game, the board game of Monopoly. You cast the dice, and you get a lot of money or don't. But at the end of the game, you're bankrupt. All of you are bankrupt because nothing got any money out of that thing, <laughs> unless you gamble on the side. So therefore, the the issue here is, we don't need a monetarist system of money. We need a well-regulated credit system, which is what the U.S. Constitution provided. For example, take the case of the United States that won the war in the peace of 18, uh, 1783. Hmm? By that time, they'd won the war, but the United States was bankrupt. Right? So we had to honor these debts. Right? So we did it, and Alexander Hamilton came up with a solution. The solution was national banking. So therefore, all we have to do is go back to national banking. Now, we're going to cancel all these assets, which are, which are not real assets, of all these, uh, these bankers. These, but that's a loss. The point is they're going to have to readjust. We have too many of them employed. So their survival depends, depends on their finding a new career, a different career than in, in merchant banking. We can't afford them anymore. They are useless. They don't produce any products. How many pro How many automobiles are made by this uh, banking system? Hmm. How many things that are edible are made by this, bank this merchant banking system? Hmm. No, it's all made for overseas. It's, and we, we pay for it, but we are not given the means to produce the income necessary to pay for this stuff anymore. So we have to reverse the we have to reverse the effects of the all these decades of ruin, which means we simply were going to use a credit system. If the project is viable, and if the end game in the project is viable, and we need it, let's take Noapa. Noapa means at least a million four million jobs. So we do it. We have other projects of the same nature. 
do it. We, with a large project of that type, you can take the limited number of people who are still actually skilled. It's a tiny minority of what used to be skilled labor in the United States is still skilled labor. Most of it's in near retirement or in retirement. But this cadre force is key for defining a program of recovery. We will go, we have also now, co with cooperation with Russia, which has a similar situation. Have certain capabilities, but not much cash. Uh, China, same thing. Uh, Japan wants to get in on it. Korea wants to be in on it. India will, will be in on it. So we will be producing more product and gradually increasing the number of productively employed people in the labor force. And that will give us the, a means to pay in advance even, to pay to keep people alive, and to get them re-educated, to give them the opportunities they need for life, and things that are being taken away from them now. So under a credit system, we will have a sufficient supply of credit available to us based on the potential of our own people to work and the skills we have and what we can share with other people in the same direction. And that's the real solution to this. It's an elementary solution, which we, the United States went through after coming as a victorious out of the Revolutionary War. We found ourselves bankrupt. We found that a, a commercial bank, or, or, or the regular banking system would not do it. We had to go to a credit system. We went to a credit system and we survived. We survived quite nicely, despite the difficulties we ran into. We'll do the same thing again. So we don't need to, to we don't need the idea of a traditional kind of banking system, because what has become known as a traditional banking system it has no resemblance really to a commercial banking system. A commercial banking system is an auxiliary feature of a credit system. In other words, you, you generate, you put out the credit which is going to employ the nation in production. But then you have a, a process, you, firms are organized, entities are organized, state entities, private entities are organized. Therefore, you have to have a system of banking, of commercial banking, under the umbrella of a system of national credit banking. Now you've got the mechanisms, and it will work just fine. It always worked. The point is the British were out to d destroy us. That's what the, the point was, of, you know, the, the president was, who, who really sell, sent us down the river, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was essentially a traitor to the United States because he w was a treasonous in the most crucial t aspect of destroying the credit system in the elimination of, the credit, of our law. It was an unconstitutional measure, but the, the, the other guys had more guns than we had at the time. And Andrew Jackson got by with his treasonous act activity. Notably, Andrew Jackson is always featured at the dinners as the Democratic Party's emblem. They got to change the Democratic Party emblem and get an honest emblem instead. <laughs> okay, we have a second question from here in the United States. Um, this is from an economist in Texas. And uh, his question regards some of the recent material that has been featured on the website in the weekly reports and otherwise. He says, Mr. LaRouche, Though I am not what you would identify as a follower of the theories of Joseph Schumpeter, and am certainly not a supporter of the Austrian school, I can't help but notice the main idea presented in the last two sessions with you and the team of survival of the more adaptable or creative species is very similar to Schumpeter's idea of creative destruction. He argues that an economic system or model cannot adapt, that cannot adapt to technological change, what you are calling an upshift, is doomed to fail, while those industries or companies that can adapt will become more productive and survive. He argues further that most of the economic entities which exist even successfully before such a change occurs will be destroyed when the change comes because they cannot change due largely to stubbornness. Is there a difference between what he argued and what you are saying now? And if there is a difference, I would be happy to know what it is. First of all, you're back to the problem of a monetary system, that the system is based on money, not on production. 
And now the Austrian school, if you look at it closely, but don't peek too much, you might, you get, we get disgusted, but uh, the Austrian school is a product of the Habsburg school. The, it, for most of recent history, the center of power, despite the British Empire, the center of power in, around the world on money is based on the Habsburg system. Um, the entirety of this s southern part of Europe and its spread is both based on that. So therefore what they're talking about, they're talking what are the parameters of which the game is played? And what are the rules of the game? And what has been the performance of the United States and France compared to Austria, for example? You have people in Austria who are, you know, sort of respectable, ordinary people. But you look at the parameters of the system, the parameters of the system are not, are not effective. And Germany was suffered the same way. Germany was, had a, a vigorous recovery after Hitler. It came from very low levels, but it was a vigorous recovery. Then it got chopped down during the, you know, about the same time that Kennedy was being chopped down. And the effects were there. France. France has not had a legitimate federal presidency or anything for a long time. It's been run on a racket, sort of a financial monetarist racket. So you, you find in various nations that you find, you, when you take nations as nations, and you examine the, their system in terms of the function of the nation, that's how you can have to judge them. But the basic thing here around the world is the failure to recognize that the money system, that is the monetary system as such, is a, a refraction of the oligarchical principle. The same principle that created the Roman Empire is successors in similar kinds of phenom political phenomena around the world. Therefore, the system is intended to continue the policy of oligarchism. So whether the oligarchy is clean, whether it washes itself once in a while or not, it may be important, but it's not fundamental. The fundamental thing is you need, you need to have a system which is based on a form of investment which is a true physical growth investment. That means increase in te technological progress. Now, all, within an economy, as he argues, within any economy, you can find in a stable economy, while, as long as it remains stable, you can find restrictions which limit success to a limited number of people and ordered in that way. So now you have a stable, fixed system which finds some wealth coming in from outside, as Austria does. Austria gets a lot of wealth, wealth from its outside implications. And so that's the problem. So people misestimate. The performance is what happens to the human species in the end result of the game. And when you look at it from that standpoint, all the myth, myths, the stories, the fables about how this worked and how that worked, you find that the crisis comes along and you realize, hey, buddy, it really didn't work. Something was wrong with it. And that's the problem with the Austrian school. And you'll find that you've, the entire, re, entirety of the Republican Party candidacy assortment are all based on that conception. They're all far right-wing monetarists. And they tend to be the worst ones. They tend more to clinical insanity. When a, you get a Democrat who wants to be a crook, he's a crook. And he's proud of it. He doesn't try to mask it with some virtuous charm, or something, uh, that, which he never really has anyway. So it's, all, it's no, no loss to anyone. But that's the point. Is it, it's, we have to understand what we mean, the difference between a credit system and a and a monetarist system, and how they function differently, and what the end result is. We in the United States, because we had a credit system basis, we even revived it under Lincoln, revived it again, we revived it under Roosevelt. We find that all, after all these periods, like the assassination of Jack Kennedy, huh? what was the significance there? There were two basic issues. One, Jack was for economy, and Jack was actually ran as a candidate for president under Eleanor Roosevelt, who talked all the way through the campaign about her, her husband.
and his policies and how these policies were going to be brought back. And for that, Jack was killed. But he was also killed because he got in the way of a very fun story. Why was Jack actually killed? They hated his economics. They wanted to be rid of him because he was like Franklin Roosevelt. They didn't want that back. Even Eisenhower had problems trying to do things in that direction. And he had a lot of authority going in after what he did in Korea. And he end, what Eisenhower, for example, did, he ended a, what could have become a prolonged permanent war in Korea, U.S. war in Korea. He got us out of there. That's what got him elected, because Truman was hated, and the, the, was hated and hateable. And Eisenhower was a war hero, and he acted with his authority as a hero at war. He used that thing to walk into North Korea, Korea, and say, no, we're going to bring this thing to an end. And he's, he campaigned on that. And he won the presidency and re-elected re on the same thing. So that, that was the story. But what Jack did, based on what were the good things that were done by Eisenhower, and were done also in France by de Gaulle, and also by the German chancellor at the time. So their efforts started a movement which, again, the British and company wanted to stop and crush. So they did. And the tail end of this thing was, was Kennedy. Kennedy was the last gasp of the recovery of the United States, which was associated with uh, these, these people, Kennedy himself. So the th thing, that, but the other thing was, how do the British win wars? Seven Years' War. The, the British model of warfare and strategy is the Seven Years' War, in which the British stayed out of the war, but they organized it. The British funded the war. They put money in to invest people in conducting war against each other. The Dutch and the British were working together. This was, again, is the old new Venetian party system. That's what it is. So, so they, they understood always that the method of winning war to maintain an empire is getting the other people to fight each other and bleed each other to death first and then come in and mop up. And that was a seven-year war understood by von Moltke uh, it, when he knew what the policy of the British was. Seven years war. And then Bismarck recognized that and he said, e echoing von Moltke later, seven years war. The new world war is going to be a seven years war. Like the, all the world wars before that under the British. Because the British always function on this basis. Why did they get us, in, get us into Vietnam? There was no reason to go into Vietnam. And MacArthur emphasized, and Eisenhower backed him up with Kennedy. No long wars in Asia. That was the policy. And the opponents of, of our, our president, Clinton, uh, then, recognized this. And they said, we're going to get rid of the Roosevelt legacy. We're going to get rid of it by getting the United States sucked into a long war, which turned out to be a 10-year war, not a 7-year war. And the difference is between what we had in the United States in people and so forth in 1943, what we had in immediately afterward, after the end of the process, about 1971, and a little beyond that, we had a seven years war. And the United States never returned from that seven years war. That is, the United States as we had had it under Kennedy never returned to the present day. And no one has shown up in the presidency who could survive and maintain that policy since then. The time has come where only the sheer understanding of the sheer horror of what awaits us may arouse some people in this United States to abandon their customary cowardice and come out and take a strong position for what the United States was made to represent. What I see out there is a sea of cowardly faces, on especially most of our leading politicians who are wearing their favorite coward face 
on every question go going on. And it's the cowardice of our leaders who are not standing beside me here today, which is our big problem. And what we need is a remedy, but the remedies are all always kept away from us by this kind of finagling. Okay, I'm going to switch over to Russia now. Uh, this is a very important question from uh, somebody at the MGMO, which is the Russian Foreign Ministry University. And just as a side note, uh, these people were recently involved in a conference which featured a video produced by uh, the team at LPAC on the credit system. Now, this gentleman asks, our Prime Minister Vladimir Putin at the recent Russia 2012 forum last week attacked the global bubble economy. Talking about the world economic crisis, he said this. This is a quote. The best case scenario calls for the rejection of bubble economics and returning to the economy of real entities, values, and assets. An economy that can be measured in human values. An economy that creates jobs instead of derivatives. That was a quote from Putin. Now, the questioner says, Mr. Putin is currently being attacked from different foreign spokesmen, both in connection with our elections and in connection with Syria. What should the Russian government do now to really get free of, the, of this monetarist trap? Should we use exchange controls or some other measures to stop the offshore funds and companies from doing capital flight? How can we get credit directed into investments in the real sector? Maybe instead of the famous Moscow as a world financial center, we should have Moscow as a physical economy center. Well, that's the problem is that you, when you get to a monetary center, and as opposed to a productive center, you're on the way down. You're, you're being absorbed in the empire. Now you'll find that I had a number of enemies in Russia, I reckon, in the Soviet Union, One, both on the STI question. One was uh, died in the process, but he did sabotage the effort. Remember, the thing you have to take into account is in that period, everyone in Russia in the 1970s was aware of the inherent failure of the Soviet system. Uh, I was among one of those who understood that. I also understood at the time that the thermonuclear weapons development had created a situation in which no future uh, government could successfully engage in general warfare because the advent of nuclear weapons and other technologies had created a situation that no one could win such a war. Therefore, the question that came to me was, to me, my, my personal judgment, well, how do we deal with that then? And I had some contacts with some military and so forth, and I found soon associations with people who had been OSS people, leading OSS figures in World War II, uh, who came to me. And we ta talked about these things, and I continued with my program for an SDI. But, but on the predicate, as I told the Soviets with whom I personally negotiated uh, on this thing, and who agreed with me on this thing, that we, we, we had to have a certain kind of cooperation. And what we have, should do is take the first thing, which we, I call the S Strategic Defense Initiative, later just called SDI, and people accepted it. We had uh, leading people in, in Germany, retired military, but still active at the same time, like retired military, in Italy, in France, and so forth, old Gaulists and all that sort of thing. And we had a, an influential bloc, which included the Vatican. And in this process, we had actually the support up to a certain point, also from the Soviet leadership what was left of it. Because they recognized that we'd reached a point where the economy of Russia was not working hmm, successfully, that war was, and the war problem was part of it, the weapons problem was part of it, big part of the problem. And we could not have a nuclear war because a nuclear war among major nations would be so terrible that 
you just would say, no, we, we've come to the point that war is not a legitimate means of statecraft. Because when you get to nuclear weapons, you, you're out of that. When you're getting into thermonuclear weapons, you're totally out of it. It's like the Neville Shute business on, on the beach. Hmm? Hmm? It's a, so that, that on the beach concept. Now what we've gone to is we've gone to a British desperation effort to go to that kind of warfare. The warfare of on the beach, which is not nuclear warfare, it's thermonuclear warfare. Now when you get to that level, you, you've got another complication. When you get to that level of warfare, you have to go all the way with a peremptory killer strike. Now a peremptory killer strike means thermonuclear weapons. And it means you're shooting for the virtual extinction of your opponent as the first step. Now the way they have it now, the thing, thing comes from Obama, President Obama. He's the stooge for the British Empire. And he should be thrown out of office because he's clinically insane, he's break, broken every law imaginable. And he should be thrown out of office, peremptorily, impeached, thrown to the garbage pail. Because we can't have him. We can't have any of these Republicans. So therefore, you've got to clear the way to get rid of Obama in order to get an electable president who's not going to be a, a complete mess. So we must throw Obama out of office and then pick a Republican leadership. It doesn't have to be only Republican. You probably get a lot of de Republicans going along with such, a, such a arrangement because they're also patriots too. So that's where the situation is. Now the problem is, if Obama were removed from office, huh, and the United States were thus returned away from Obama, then the British could not successfully pull off a thermonuclear surprise attack. This, the strike is, first, the Israelis. And all this negotiation with the Israelis is cr crazy. And the Israelis, who are any sense at all, don't want any part of this. But they've got a government in there, which is British-backed government, in, in Israel, which is prepared to make a last minute surprise launch of a nuclear attack on Iran. This is supposed to set forth an, an attack which will go together with Syria, attack on Syria, uh, and, and, and on Iran at the same time. And the, but the tr main strike will be a preemptive strike against Russia and China and other countries. It will be a full blast thermonuclear attack with everything in the U.S. Navy, uh, uh, especially the submarines and other th pieces of apparatus, and all the backup you want from it, so that the first stroke will be a killer stroke, peremptory stroke. And that's what we're headed for, and it won't work, because the attempt to do that will simply create an impossible situation for the continuation of any form of decent human life on this planet. And the British won't benefit, but the British have a different mentality than Obama does. Obama will kill himself. That's his profile. Just the way that his predecessor, the Emperor Nero, did. Exactly the same way. His tyranny, Nero's tyranny, went step by step by step by step. Until the point where he found he was going to be defeated and he killed himself in order to avoid defeat. You've got Obama is the same profile. His measures that he's taken, more aggressive, more aggressive, more aggressive, more aggressive, more, more violent, more fraudulent, more criminal, more treasonous, every step. He's going marching down the road where he doesn't win, he has to kill himself. He may not actually kill himself, but that's his intention, that's his profile right now. So we're in that kind of situation where the British have gotten, gotten themselves an American puppet, Obama, who's nothing but a puppet. He's not really human. He throws basketballs against the wall. That's his, pol that's his political thinking. Uh, he should throw his head against the wall, maybe, and make, get it back in shape somehow. Way or the other. But this is what our situation is. And people have to understand this. This is the problem. We've reached the point that we can no longer have general warfare on this planet. You can have police actions which are really maintaining the peace, in a sense. But you cannot have full-scale warfare, extinction warfare which is what this is, because you will lose the human species. But the British monarchy doesn't care. Obama will kill himself. The British monarchy will not give up, because they see themselves as the 
empire, the tradition of the empire, going back to the siege of Troy. They see themselves as that empire. And they have embedded in them an instinct, which I understand very well, an instinct which will not let them go. The only way to deal with them is shut them off and take away their American stooges. Without their American stooges today, they don't have anything. You have to get Obama out of office. If you're not out to get Obama out of office on reasonable grounds and peremptorily, you're not a patriot. Well, despite the fact that today is the disgusting 60th anniversary of the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, and she might refer to herself as uh, Queen Helen of Troy or something, she's in no way, <laughs> she's not the face that launched a thousand ships, that's for sure. Um, I have another question, which you addressed, I just want to give you another chance, uh, from a Moscow political writer whose specialty is the United States and China. He says, recently, Henry Kissinger visited Moscow for talks with our Prime Minister Vladimir Putin. My information is that the visit was initiated from the Russian side, showing that our government wants to keep talking not only with the present U.S. administration. My question is, do you see any possible silver lining if Mitt Romney becomes president? Absolutely not. I can assure you of that. I've had occasion to look at his background, his machinery, his apparatus. I wouldn't like to give them a passport to enter the United States, <laughs> let alone the presidency. <laughs> so we don't have any, ch I, there are many Republicans out there, probably as many as Democrats, uh, who are not insane. Uh, uh, some of them are very good people. But uh, when it comes to getting a party organized, the, the kind of fascist thing that goes through many Republican circles uh, is such, I don't think we want that a party dominated by them in charge. It's not that the Republicans are bad in themselves, but the, the whole organization is dominated by a force which is not good. Uh, what we have left is the Clinton's past position in the sense that anything that would work would probably work around Bill Clinton. Uh, because he's the most friendly of the people of that type from, from that standpoint. But he's not doing that right now. He's backed down. So I'm the only one of that democratic type around who understands the presidency and who would be, but I'm too old. I know the, tr I know the game, I know how to do it, but I'm too old to do it. I can only do what I'm doing now. And sometimes the strain gets a little bit tough on me. I mean, I'm almost 90, you know. I'm in good shape for 90 and will be good in good shape for 90 for a long time to come, probably. Unless somebody aborts that suddenly by... <laughs> but no, the point is, we need a... We can get... I know we can develop a team around a, pres, a, pre, a democratic presidency, which could be developed. But it can, we can't do it without getting rid of Obama. This nation will not survive unless we get rid of Obama. And the British, with, that, with Obama as their tool in place, the British can trigger the thermonuclear war which they want to have happen. And they've got it under control. And our, our politicians are so cowardly. Our Democrats are so damn cowardly. They don't understand warriors. We're no longer a generation of warriors. And we've been killed by Vietnam and other things from a nation of warriors, who could be warriors when needed. Huh? They don't have the guts anymore. They don't have the guts to qualify as senator or something like that anymore. Because they, they whimper. They don't realize that when you put your, yourself on the line, as a soldier does in war, or as a politician must do, a leading politician must do in the United States, he must put himself on line. That job is not his. It's the job is his mission. And if he loses, it's, it's all right if he's performed his mission. And if his mission succeeded. But this idea, well, I don't want to take a chance of losing my career. That's not a patriot. Huh? And the problem is we have members of the Senate, members of the House, and especially the Senate's most important in this respect, who do not have that kind of courage. 
they're not eligible for combat. They'll lose the war to avoid the combat. And that's what we're getting in the case of our, our politicians now. Our democratic leadership is disgusting precisely this reason. They will not stand up and say, I'm a soldier in this war for our nation. I'm a representative. I'm a leader in our nation. My job is to be on the front lines and make sure it happens. They say, no, that would risk my career. And how, if, you risk, if you throw away your purpose, where the hell is your career? I guess it's old geezers like me who don't uh, have a problem with that. Okay, we have one last question. And you've addressed this uh, substantially during the broadcast today, but I wanted to ask it because it's, it's very relevant in light of the events that have happened over the weekend at the United Nations, for example, with the veto by Russia and China uh, on the resolution against Syria. Uh, this is a question, again, from Moscow, uh, from a gentleman who identifies himself as a strategic analyst and a writer. He says, what would be the consequences of the fall of the Assad regime? Will it mean a breakup of Syria and a civil war or a radical Islamist government there? What will be the impact of such events on the rest of the Middle East, on Iran, and on Russia and China? How high is the possibility of broader warfare with the involvement of Turkey and Iran? Well, the war, war is coming from someplace. It's not coming from Syria. It's the Syrian government has nothing to do with this war as such. The war is coming from the British Empire and it's coming from the United States as a, as a pawn of the British Empire, a disgusting pawn of the British Empire. This was all set up as an operation which started with Libya uh, and you had a senator of the United States who made an illegal decision, a criminal decision actually from the standpoint of, of law, uh, in putting through that law which set forth the Libyan war, the United States role in the Libyan war. That was a crime, a treasonous crime of ambition or cowardice, something of that sort. Uh, we got into the thing. Obama got himself Im impeachable again and again and again. The guy belongs in prison for life. Maybe that's a self, that's his him. Um, what he did it was virtual treason. What they did to, a, to a Muammar al-Qaddafi was murder. Here's a guy, he's captured. He's bleeding. He's been shot. He's captured. And they order him killed. And the orders were form in, formed in France and Britain. The orders were, we do not want this guy alive because if he's kept alive as a captive, there's going to be a big discussion, debate throughout the world about what his crimes are. Then you won't be rid of him. You won't, be, you won't have had the stroke of terror that you want to strike in order to strike it into the Middle East. So by eliminating Obama in that way in the Middle East, you strike terror in the whole region because you want to use that region for the attack which is going to set off World War III. Now, many people, I think, in the military understood something about this, the senior people. At least some of them did. But they don't talk about those things publicly. I do. My job. Hmm? And they had, the right, they had the right answer on this thing. They said, stall it off, delay it, delay it, delay it. This cannot happen. They all know that's the end of civilization if that war ever starts. And they wonder how much they're going to go to the bat to stop that. But a real soldier will probably go all the way to form the mission. So that's what the situation is. We are in, in a position where Russia and China are preparing for thermonuclear warfare. That's what I know is there. That's what they know is there. And only if we prevent the United States under Obama from being induced to have a surprise attack, which is conditioned by using the Israeli funk there. He's an idiot, an absolute idiot. But he's a British pawn. He's nothing but a British pawn. They use him to get Israel to drop a 
some something on Iran, which will start the whole chain reaction. And they wanted the chain reaction in Syria and chain reaction in Iran to go together. Now the purpose of the war is to start the, start the war. Now that goes inherently to a strategic conflict with Russia and other countries and China. We now have an alliance of Russia and China and implicitly support from other countries which are not going to submit to extinction because they know the game, name of the game is to destroy the Asian countries. That's the purpose. So that Russia and China and other countries have no choice. The intention on the British side with support from the Obama administration is the extinction of the nations of Russia and China and other countries. They have no other choice. So the question is, why do we have to have the war? We don't have to have the war. We have to get rid of Obama. Put him into some cage someplace where he's safe. Because we don't want another assassination to spoil the whole problem. But we're at that point. And what I'm looking at is I'm looking at my fellow citizens and especially leading members of government as in the main a bunch of pussy cowards. They just haven't got the guts to put themselves on the line for the purpose of serving their nation. Okay, thank you very much, Lynn. I think you've said what needs to be said on this occasion. So uh, I'd like to thank our audience for watching today, and the, the proceedings of this webcast will be archived in full on the LaRouche Pack website. So if you miss any part, or if you wish to go back and view it again, uh, it will be available within uh, a very short amount of time on the LaRouche Pack website. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you again, Lynn, and stay tuned to LPAC TV. <laughs>